Hey guys, it's Avondale, and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Walls, where I take you behind the walls of the Noxcrew Game Show. I'd like to remind you, as always, if you haven't seen today's episode yet, check the top right-hand corner of your screen. You'll see a link uh, to go to the episode there, so we don't spoil it for you. So now that you've had time to do that, uh, today we are talking about Factory, and my special guest for the day is the Butcher himself. It's Antlia. <laughs> Hey, you sound less scary in person. Yeah, although I've been recorded as the uh, like uh, grim and uh, sarcastic Finnish person of the Nox crew because apparently I sound much older than I am. <laughs> well, how old do you think you sound, and then how old are you? Uh, I've been told I sound something like uh, 27, but I'm actually only 21 years old. Well, there you go. But I sounded uh, exactly the same when I joined the Nox group, but like three years ago, so... <laughs> so that was really uh, interesting to hear, I'm sure. Uh, so speaking of joining the Nox crew three years ago, uh, this game that we're looking at here is probably almost three years old, if I had to guess. Uh, it's pretty, it was built a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it was um, the first game I built. Uh, well, I haven't built many, but... Um, Back then, I used to do much more building. Like, butchery is not my main job. Right. Even would you think I build stuff uh, as well, to later nowadays. This uh, was just um, We needed a PvP game in the game show, so I took the job and came up with this. Sure, and what was the actual initial idea? Because I've heard Nox before claim that. Uh, he built the first one. <laughs> I'm always curious. Oh yeah, yeah. I usually forget that that's happened before. Yeah, Nox actually built the um, really, really bad first prototype, <laughs> which was some kind of a mansion. He isn't much of a builder. Uh, I was gonna say, um, I believe you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though the standards back then were much lower than nowadays. Like, so I decided I want to do better than that. And <laughs> so you took the job on. Yeah, yeah. And this was like back in what 2011. This like um, build would be regarded as pretty good. Like now it's passable, but back then it was. Uh, everybody told me it was amazing. Yeah. It's amazing how uh, time changes the perception of things, especially in exactly, Minecraft. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you think about it, it's been a while since we've had an update, but when they were going gung-ho with the snapshots there for a while, I mean, you could be a week behind and be completely out of the loop. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, exactly. now here we are. Uh, so, uh, now that we've talked a little bit about sort of where you made the game, uh, let's move on and talk about uh, how it played out in the episode. So. Uh, this was the final game between the Celestial Ice Dragons and the Evac crew. Uh, yeah. Winner moves on, loser goes home. Yeah, that was actually the first game of, I mean, match of this season that I played the Butcher in because I was absent for the first first match. Yeah, oh, that's uh, right. Wait, actually, actually, I'm talking bull crap here because this is the third match, or is it? Uh, I, this I this is no the idea. third match. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because I I basically only my involvement with the game show consists of coming on and playing the butcher, so I'm not really up to date with the the matches. Sure, but this was one that you actually got to see, um, and so th there was three things I wanted to talk about uh, in the episode. The first one was uh, the flank by Celestial Ice Dragons uh, that they coordinated. Uh, and when, sort of, when they got into this room and the team saw each other, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and bust in here so we can, uh, yeah. take a look at it. They were actually sitting here and they were just, there was this 30 second period where they were just rapid firing arrows over the edge like this. Yeah, well it's a safe way to try to get some damage in, so. Yeah, and both teams were just so nervous to take the first death, that the first hit of damage. Uh, exactly. And the patience really did end up paying off uh, for EVAC crew. Like one thing with this arena is that um, 
you don't get to see it beforehand. You might have seen it in the episode, but you can't really remember the details. Right, and it's totally different once you get in here first person as well. Yeah. We let them look from those uh, viewing platforms up there, the windows, but uh, oh, yeah. you never really see it for real until you get in here. Yeah, exactly. And there's so many like passageways they didn't notice even. Like I remember building um, where's the chimney one? Wait, wait. It's yeah, let's it's find been it. a while I've been here <laughs> myself. Oh, up here, I think. Oh, no, it's where I am right now, actually. Okay. Like, I don't think uh, anyone anyone used this passageway. Oh yeah, this goes all the way up to the roof, right? Yeah. Now, yeah, could you imagine if the uh, if celestial ice dragons had found this on their flank? Yeah, exactly. Or wait, is this too high for them? Maybe they did. Oh no, it was a floor too high. They would have needed to get up here. Actually, here's an interesting question for you. Um, I've PvP'd you a couple of times before, and you're usually really good. Um, and one of the interesting things about the way that these maps are designed uh, when we do these 2D fighting arenas is, you know, you have, what, uh, seven blocks of width here? Uh, so yes. strafing isn't necessarily uh, going to come into play at all. Uh, there's not a whole lot of sort of this side-to-side uh, -side movement, but there is no. a lot of vertical combat. Um, yeah, and I just I want to hear your thoughts on sort of uh, the advantage or disadvantage that height uh, plays in when you're fighting uh, in PvP games like this. Well, let me just first say that the verticality in this is purely because, like, it's obviously obviously this was made 2D because it's easier to film and. Um, you have to have that verticality there to make a big battlefield. Right. Because you can't make it really deep. And, for example, you can't have any spots where they can hide from the camera. Like exactly. the players. So, ob obviously, it's always a good, good thing to be up high in Minecraft. Because uh, the bows, how the bows work. Um, like, I, I don't think there's any limit on how low you can shoot, like, um, if you're up high you can shoot anywhere you want, but right. it's much harder to shoot uh, someone who's up Yeah, exactly, there. you think about it, like, they, there was a point in time where the blue team was down here, uh, and they were trying to shoot up at the yellow team who was up in that window, and they just absolutely yeah. uh, couldn't handle it because... Uh, just the height advantage was so insane. I mean, you can stand here and you can shoot the blue team in the feet before they even get a chance to come out and return fire. Sure, you there was no like tactical considerations going into this when I made this. Right. Uh, like I just made something. But it did play out really interestingly in this match. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sort of one of the things that I would argue was the downfall of the ice dragons uh, in this game was yeah. uh, sort of the lack of communication between yeah, the team members on that flank. Yeah, and that's like a, it's much harder to communicate for if you don't know like the map that well because for example if you watch a competitive Counter Strike big part of that, and surely other games, but I'm not familiar with them, is that um, you know the callouts for different places. Mm -hmm. and that makes communication like 100 times easier. Now you just say, oh, he's on the ladder. And everyone else goes, like, what ladder? Yeah, and I, like I would that. agree with you that it absolutely does make it better, like, when, uh, towards the beginning of it, when they first saw each other, and the uh, blue team was basically just like, I see them, they're over there. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that type of communication uh, isn't very helpful, but the type of communication that they really missed out on was when uh, Zeiss climbed the ladder and went into the fray, uh, and nobody knew. <laughs> uh, he got up to the top, he died, and the message popped up in chat, and then Zaypora said, wait, what happened? Are you dead? No, no he right. gets hit by arrows, it's a double team, he's being kept behind, but no, he gets taken down! Zeiss yes. arrests! Oh, and back and Zeiss. shot down! Another one, but... Wait, wait, what about? No! Died. It's 
th that sort of thing that I think ultimately cost them. Uh, the patience paid off for uh, the team with the height advantage on this one. But there was a point in time where uh, both of the yellow team members actually retreated up the stairs. If uh, Celestial had used that opportunity to climb the ladder, uh, they would have had a lot better chance uh, pushing up this last flight of stairs than they would have uh, trying to shoot up over this lat this uh, yeah. railing for as long as they did. Yeah, I feel like they should have taken like a much more uh, mobile attitude in this game. Like they. Many times they got stuck in one place and didn't want to move from there. They could have got an ad advantage and surprise like going around the map and yeah. not like holding up in one place. I agree. And perhaps the most exciting moment of the episode was uh, was when they uh, rushed in to kill uh, Silver after the uh, first kill happened. Uh, when I can't remember who it was came down the ladder. Uh, but then they got yeah. that kill trade right at the bottom, even though Silver was down. Uh, he was actually w the weaker of the two, and he managed to pull out a kill trade out of that. That was yeah. a really spectacular fight. Yeah, exactly. But I feel like um, this map and this game like could be much better if it was like a best of three. Obviously, that would take too much time, but I feel like we could get more out of it if... Like the teams could experiment a little bit. Yeah, that's true. Maybe a best of three setting or uh, something that we could do is your team has uh, respawns enabled, but uh, there's uh, sort of a set number of deaths that you can get or something yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. I think the original concept behind making it only one life to live was that... Um, you know, when you when you die, you're dead. Like, <laughs> there's no uh, coming back from the dead. You're just out. Uh, but yeah. it it would be really interesting to see how a type of game like this would play out if the rules were more similar to like yeah. a competitive shooter with respawns. Yeah. Also, like um, if you only got that one life, you become much more careful, and that's also like part of the reason why why they played so carefully and like lobbed the arrows over there and yeah, absolutely. didn't want to make a move. And one of the reasons why the game dragged out as long as it did. Uh, yeah. Here's something topical that I just thought of. Um, we've designed all these PvP arenas based on uh, the current uh, Minecraft combat tactics, but uh, the 1.9 update is going to be the combat update. Uh, really? Yeah, we're hearing potential uh, Things like enchantments to bows that make them either fire quicker or do more damage, or, uh, well, they already can do more damage, I guess, but like fire quicker, uh, potentially yeah. have different drops in the arrows. Uh, they're talking about maybe adding new weapons, potentially dual wielding stuff, uh, parrying things with swords. Uh, yeah, that, that would be something like, I think, would add much more depth into the combat than anything. It's just like the basic combat mechanics. Ad yep. Adding like more depth and not just switch to the combat. Like Absolutely. I mean, you think about amazing. how much the critical hit added to the combat in Minecraft. Yeah. Uh, very little tweaks can really provide you with big changes in gameplay. And so it's going to be interesting to see what they change, but also how well our combat arenas hold up to the new changes. Uh, that they yeah, to the systems. I think it'll be fine because, like, for example, like I said, this arena is not designed with those mechanics in mind. Right. It's just an area for them to be in. Okay, so we're here outside the butcher's cave. Uh, in the end, actually, that's an interesting uh, thing. Look at the biome there. Uh, yeah. On this part of your screen right here, jungle and the end. Uh, it makes it yeah. so much creepier. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to be fair, this is the part I most hate about the game show. Like, this feels like such a cheap, cheap thing to be do doing. I'm <laughs> like, um, in this cage and... Yeah, yeah we, we, we pretend it's your home, I think. Um, yeah. I don't know, how, if we could change it, what would you change it to? Uh, I don't know, like, I much more like my, my actual room in the... Decision dome, like where I usually spend. If I'm watching a game, I'm preparing for the next massacre. Right. <laughs> Backstage. Decision dome. Yeah. 
So, uh, well, we'll actually head over there in a second, but while we're here, I want you to, uh, sort of talk to me a little bit about, uh, what it's like to be the butcher, uh, how you come up with the things that you say in the episodes. I'm actually gonna come down inside your, uh, your little cave with sure. you there, because, uh, because the spire, man, is just, <laughs> it's gonna be the worst. Okay, yeah, yeah. so, we're, so we're down hiding in the butcher's cave. Yeah, what, what do you, sort of, how do you... Uh, prepare your different uh, jokes that you do. Uh, how how do how do you make the butcher come alive? Well, uh, I actually didn't start doing the jokes uh, like uh, from the beginning, which I regret because now I have some left over for the next season. Oh. And um, basically, there's nothing special there. I just come up with them on the spot, like. Uh, minutes earlier, then I write them down and copy-paste them in. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. It's just, it's really amazing because, I mean, you think about how Minecraft characters work, right? Like, yeah. everybody looks the same, you know, more or less. You get yeah. a body with two arms uh, and a face, but somehow you're able to put so much emotion into a Minecraft character, right? Like, if you're on a server with somebody and uh, you guys aren't talking together in person or in chat, they could like wave to you and like do something like this that are, are yeah, hop. Everybody knows that hopping means happy. And uh, somehow you're able to turn a Minecraft avatar into something that looks relatively terrifying, you know? Uh, it's a mm. character that I think you could ar argue that everybody loves to hate a little bit, right? Like, <laughs> that's kind of how the book yeah. works. Yeah, and that's like, um, that's probably why they added the pit of shame to the <laughs> The game pit show. of shame, that's so funny. Let's actually whip over there real quick and we'll talk about it. Okay, so we're in the Decision Dome. It's still set up from the leftovers of our Insomnia stage show the other day. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, I wanted to mention the pit of shame was like a very, very last minute addition, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, and I lied to you earlier, I must say. It's not the cave I hate the most, it's the pit. The pit <laughs> makes you sad. <laughs> yeah, like, the, uh, I came to the first, like, uh, recording that I had, and, like, looked around the decision dome, and ju then just noticed that they had added something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know why. <laughs> I guess it's funny, but it's also like um, a bit embarrassing. Yeah, and I think that was uh, I don't know. We w the reason it actually came in, uh, I can tell you is um, oh we're missing a block there. Uh, I had to put these barrier blocks around the outside of the decision dome so the chickens wouldn't spill off, right? And um, yeah. sort of the idea was that I needed the. Like, basically, you've seen the chickens get up on top of these barrier blocks. It's because we had yeah. to lower it here to be able to let you make this jump, and I fell in the pit. Oh! oh the shame. Shame. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, like, that was the thing. We, we lowered them specifically so you can make that jump. And uh, while we were doing that... Uh, Somebody said, well, what happens if he still misses it? And uh, I don't even remember who suggested the pit of shame, but yeah. uh, it was most mostly the point of it was just to give the uh, the audience, you know, something fun to look for every time you try to do that jump. I wonder if he's going to make it. Uh, yeah, at 10 it was um, the first match that was played uh, when I was absent, and Tonex uh, <laughs> played the butcher. Actually failed the jump. He the missed the time. jump on the first try, and yeah. uh, we we wanted him to miss the jump on like the third game. We were gonna have him yeah. purposefully do it, but he missed it on it completely on accident on the very first try. Uh, one of the funniest things I've ever seen in person, uh, <laughs> yeah. for sure. But then, like I watched at the Twitch chat, and everybody's like, "Would you wreck?" And <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, "Oh." Yeah. I'm sold. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know if I can say this, but I haven't actually missed a jump uh, unpurposefully myself. Yeah. Uh, in the episodes, it's always Noxide telling me to do it. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. It's all for the joy of the game. Yeah. 
I'm just waiting for the perfect moment to actually make a jump that uh, yeah. he sets me the fan. Right. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks a lot to Antlia, the butcher, for coming on to talk about Factory with me. Yeah, well, thanks, I guess. Like, uh, I don't usually get to talk. Or, like, people might not know that there's actually a person, living person, who has his own thoughts <laughs> behind this character. That's, that's so deep. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I really enjoyed having you. Uh, it was uh, a lot, a lot of fun talking to you, uh, and hopefully we get to do it again sometime. And he yeah. makes the jump yet again. <laughs> yeah, I usually train this like uh, fifty times before each episode. <laughs> fifty times practice. You hear this? This man is dedicated. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. So until next time, I've been Avondale. Thanks for watching. Okay, so I'm sure everybody. Uh, Everybody's story is a little bit different, but I'm curious about yours. How'd you actually get started playing Minecraft? Yeah, well, um, the first version was actually like I'm, I'm sure all the criminal claims have been uh, outtimed by now. Like <laughs> I pir pirated like the some first alpha version of Minecraft. Instantly, I fell in love with it. But. The problem back then was that I didn't have anything to buy stuff from internet with uh, back in the day. But I had a friend who, who had a um, credit card or something, so I had some other kind of currency. So I got um, some homeless person to buy me a bottle of vodka from the store <laughs> and then traded that for Minecraft <laughs> the following day. Oh, that is fantastic.